protests in Sudan. Security forces shot dead another 14 people. Pro democracy demonstrations are being met with force. Network Al Jazeera, which had been covering the demonstrations, says its bureau chief has been arrested. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and look at how news is reported. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. Sudan's flirtation with democracy ends in a coup d'etat. How far will the junta go to control what we know about the story? The journalists arrested in the aftermath of the coup in Myanmar finally get their day in court. The jury's still out on the justice system there. A far-right journalist turned presidential contender. France's Eric Zemmour and the TV news channel behind his rise. And the metaverse is the next frontier. The mashup that exposes the fine line between Facebook's attempts at PR. It's completely immersive. And parody. This past Wednesday, November 17th, was supposed to be the day that Sudan, after more than 30 years under various forms of dictatorship, returned to civilian rule. That never happened. Just three weeks before the country's military was due to return to its barracks, handing over its share of power to civilians, the generals deposed the transitional government they had been a part of and conducted a coup. That triggered mass unrest, reminiscent of Sudan's revolution in 2019 that deposed the longtime dictator Omar al-Bashir. Since then, it's been about controlling the streets and the narrative through tactics Sudan has seen before. Protesters shot, the state broadcaster taken over, journalists arrested, the internet blacked out. But in a country that came so close to democracy it could taste it, the population hasn't rolled over. Activists are still finding ways, including some low-tech ones, to organize. Journalists are doing the same to get the story out. Our starting point this week is Khartoum. Nearly two and a half years after the Sudanese spring, when mass demonstrations led to the downfall of longtime dictator Omar al-Bashir, citizens are back on the streets. Less than a month ago, a country that has spent 52 of the last 65 years under military rule was on the verge of restoring something it hasn't had since 1989, its democracy. It fell just three weeks short. Bashir was ousted by the military in April 2019, and then a power sharing agreement was put together between the civilian FFC, the Forces for Freedom and Change, and the Transitional Military Council, the TMC. Now, this sovereignty council, the transitionary body, was only meant to be around for three years and three months, and then meant to hand over power to a civilian leader this week. But only three weeks ahead of this handover date, we found ourselves in a military coup. The clearest signal to people that a coup had actually taken place was switching on TV, Sudan TV, and seeing, you know, the sort of the, the military bands and the military songs play. Um, and immediately then we saw that editorial shift in um, the content and also the, the sort of aesthetics of the uh, Sudan TV, shifting back into more Islamist signaling by presenters and then and also the content which was being shown on TV and more importantly, what wasn't shown on TV. State-controlled Sudan TV showed the coup leader, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, refusing to call the coup a coup. He branded the takeover a corrective measure instead, tried to justify it as a continuation of the 2019 anti-al-Bashir revolution, and argued that the civilian military transitional government somehow posed a threat to peace and security because it was unstable, having just destabilized that government by overthrowing it. The ugliest of all, perhaps, was the timing coincided with a clear upturn in, uh, in civilian fortunes. The, the civilians had not been doing very well in government, but recently, you know, key economic indicators had started to turn around. Uh, the inflation had begun to fall, balance of trade had improved for Sudan. And I think, you know, those instances of success started to worry a military who had banked on civilians failing and that failure being their wrap back to power. 
Four days before the coup, the Sudanese took to the streets in their millions across the country to deliver one particular message. It wasn't pro-government protests, but it was pro-democracy and anti-military protests. The message was clear, we do not want military rule. Perhaps um, this alliance of coup plotters just realized that maybe now is the right moment to seize power, that they can take a showdown between them and the Sudanese people. Attempting to control the masses and the narrative, the military has borrowed tactics straight out of Omar al-Bashir's media and repression playbook, the takeover of the state broadcaster and a communications blackout. Landline internet is still functioning, but the vast majority of Sudanese rely on mobile data, 3G and 4G, and both have been shut down. That has left reporters cut off from their sources, their means of distributing information, and has denied activists the digital tools they rely on to organize. The internet blackout is quite clearly being used to keep different resistance committees, which are well, the backbone of the resistance movement, from mobilizing. But beyond that, you know, businesses have lost money because uh, they're unable to contact their customers, adding pressure to the coup regime to reverse this internet blackout. And the, the uh, resistance committees have had previous experiences with um, mobilizing people during internet blackouts in 2019. It's not as effective as the regime might want it to be. In every area, there is a local resistance committee and they have been able to disseminate information in old school ways, you know, house to house, they send out flyers, they let people know, people choosing to not go to work, to grind the country to a halt in order to demonstrate their anger um, and their refusal to accept this military rule. So even though the military is trying to completely isolate the Sudanese people and disconnect them from the world and each other, I have been completely awed and impressed by what they've been able to do despite all of the obstacles. It is really to the credit of protesters and demonstrators following the coup that they have retained a non-violent approach to this. And that non-violent approach has absolutely confounded the military because they, they stand on the ends of streets with, with the tools of violence in their hands and it's very hard to respond. So the military are hyper aware of the optics and reality of, of violence and what that can mean for their attempts to really maintain control over the streets in Khartoum. In another tactic straight out of the coup plotters' playbook, news organizations, both domestic and international, have been targeted. Journalists organized a protest of their own this past week, a silent one, symbolizing the authorities' efforts to restrain their reporting. They've had their offices raided, some of their transmissions blocked, to stop their versions of the story from getting to the outside world. We spoke with General Al-Burhan's press advisor, who would not comment on those measures or on the arrests of reporters, columnists, and editors, including Al Jazeera's bureau chief in Khartoum. All of them have spent time behind bars since October 25th, the day the military music started playing on Sudan TV. You've had um, Bloomberg, a, a shock correspondent, Maha Atalb, and her crew were arrested and held for a couple of hours in Khartoum. But another quite prominent columnist of the newspaper Al Demokrati, uh, Fayez Asilik, was arrested after giving an interview for Al Jazeera's Khartoum bureau in which he criticized the coup. Al Demokrati is known for generally being favorable towards the transition. And a few days after the coup, security forces raided its headquarters and went to the home of its editor in order to arrest him as well. Another thing it's worth to note that the FM relays for BBC Arabic and Monte Carlo radio were stopped in Khartoum. When you stop relays, you're trying to stop international media from reflecting what they are seeing happening in Sudan, so that Sudan becomes a small closed box for the propaganda that the regime or the junta here wants to spread. So the safety of journalists uh, is at stake. Um, news and the verification of uh, what's happening in Sudan is at stake. 
right down to the basics, like the casualty figures resulting from social unrest. This past Wednesday, the day the transition to democracy was supposed to take place, 15 more protesters were killed that we know about. Is that the whole story? With most of the internet closed for business, all those journalists arrested, all the intimidation taking place, we just do not know. Because freedom of expression in Sudan has proved fleeting, the country is back to square one. Or is it? My rational response was, well, this was inevitable and here we go again. The coverage of uh, demonstrations through accounts on social media, how people are mobilizing, that gives hope that actually what was cultivated in the last two years is not lost. And instead, now actually being tested and put into good use under the current circumstances. You cannot undo 30 years of repression in two years. People are finding ways around it, amplifying what's coming out from the ground. They're saying, you know, we are going to have our own narrative. We are not going to compromise. We're not going to negotiate. We're not going to share power. This time around, we're going to fight in the narrative space as well as in the streets. Turning to Myanmar now, it's been nine months since that military coup, the one that ousted the democratically elected Aung San Suu Kyi, Nick Muirhead's been following developments. Nick, the journalists arrested there, the news outlets banned. Where do those legal cases stand? That media crackdown was severe. At least five news outlets were banned, more than 125 journalists arrested, 47 of whom are still behind bars. Now, those cases are making their way through the courts, military courts, and the sentencing has been cause for alarm. Starting with journalist Min Yao from the Democratic Voice of Burma, he got sentenced to three years in prison for, quote, criminal mutiny. Ang Cha, a DVB reporter, and Zou Zou, a freelancer for Mizima News, they both got two years in prison. And then there's the American journalist Danny Fenster, who works for Frontier Myanmar. Five months ago, he was arrested while trying to leave the country. Last week, he was sentenced to 11 years in prison for supposedly publishing fake news and an unlawful association with an illegal group. The unlawful association charge, that would be based on the work that Fenster did for Myanmar Now, a news outlet that the junta has banned. Right, but the thing is, Myanmar Now says that Fenster stopped working for them in July 2020, so seven months before the outlet was banned. In other words, when Fenster was associated with that news outlet, it was perfectly legal. Now, earlier this week, after an intervention, probably a better way to put it is pressure from the U.S. through a former ambassador, the authorities dropped the charges against Fenster. So why would the authorities go to all that trouble if they're just going to release the guy? It's hard to say. The um, junta is not wanting to make new enemies of outside governments right now. It's feeling isolated. Last month, the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, um, barred Myanmar from attending its biannual summit because the country had failed to implement a peace plan that had been agreed. Um, at home, it looks like the junta is trying to consolidate power. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is now up on charges of election fraud and lawless actions in a trial that the media will not be allowed to attend. And then, of course, you've got the 47 journalists still in prison and the thousands of activists who took part in the anti-coup demonstrations. Many of them are still awaiting trial and there probably isn't an ambassador coming to negotiate their release. Okay, thanks, Nick. France's presidential election is still five months away, and one prospective candidate, a high-profile journalist, is shaping up as a big part of the story. Eric Zamour is a veteran polemicist. His hostility towards Islam and ethnic minorities has already earned him two convictions for hate speech. He's yet to declare himself a candidate, but multiple polls have Zamour in second place, right behind President Emmanuel Macron. He owes much of his popularity to CNews, a right-wing channel that has long provided him with a platform for his punditry. CNews is now France's second most watched news channel and, despite having broadcast regulators on its case, seems to be having an agenda-setting impact on politics there. The Listening Post's Daniel Turi now on the rise of Eric Zemmour and the mainstreaming of the far right in French media. On a l'impression de vivre un peu maintenant à l'époque de Trump, 
avec le pays qui est fracturé en deux. Et les médias sont très, très responsables de ça. Je pense que du bien de ces news, parce qu'à la base, c'est le groupe Canal+, qui a changé la vie de la télévision en France. Les quartiers, attends, attends, attends. Des quartiers Attends, attends, j'ai un truc à dire, Zemmour, si tu vois la vidéo, s'il te plaît, te renie pas la face. Vole pas toi la face. Je manque de respect à la religion musulmane. Je manque de respect à tout le monde. Eric Zemmour, s'il te plaît. He may not be an official candidate, but Eric Zemmour is playing up to the hype. His nationwide book tour looks and sounds like a campaign run. So does his tour of TV studios, where he's debated presidential contenders. L'Islam est tout à fait aux antipodes de la France. The more Zemmour talks and the more he offends, Je veux obliger les gens à donner comme prénom à leurs enfants des prénoms français. Comme... The more media coverage he seems to get. We saw him on the front page of Paris Match. He was uh, swimming in the Mediterranean Sea with his uh, young assistant. It kind of glamorizes his image. And it's something that very few uh, politicians in France would, would get. He's been invited as well on various shows. And Zemmour is not even a politician yet. He's not even running. Le problème aujourd'hui, c'est non seulement... The problem at the moment is not only that all the media outlets are talking about him, using his rise as the justification, which is understandable. But what raises questions is that any problem provocation he makes, any racist, sexist or homophobic comment, becomes a national debate. He is the one setting the tone of the political debate in France. Zemmour's public profile has been decades in the making, and the French media have been central to his rise. He made his name in the 1990s as a political journalist with the right-wing daily Le Figaro, then became a television pundit. It was in that role in 2011 that Zemmour was first convicted and fined for hate speech after he claimed on air that most drug dealers were black or Arab. In 2018, he was convicted again, this time for saying that France had been, quote, invaded by Muslims. Bonsoir à tous, une heure de débat entre Eric Zemmour, Bernard and Lévy. Despite those offenses, in 2019, Zemmour landed his most prominent platform yet at CNews, a channel that had recently undergone a radical makeover under its owner, conservative billionaire Vincent Bolloré. CNews isn't exactly like any other channel. In France's media regulations, there is a strong principle of internal pluralism, whereby different editorial perspectives are represented within a single news outlet. The particularity of CNews is that it's a more politically slanted channel, slanted to the right. Plus de la moitié d'entre vous pensent que l'islamo-gauchisme est une réalité à l'université. C'est le résultat de notre sondage exclusif. And it has an editorial line that didn't really exist before in French television. And that's what has made CNews successful. Et c'est d'ailleurs ce qui a fait le succès de CNews. Dans ce cas-là, en fait, on a conçu... On a... They designed a show specifically catered to Eric Zemmour's personality. It was called Face à l'Info, Facing the News where a host and several panelists comment on the news of the day. In truth, it could have been named Face à Zemmour. Vous avez une population qui est française, euh, euh, blanche, euh, chrétienne, euh, de culture gréco-romaine, et à la place, 40 ans plus tard, vous avez une population qui est maghrébine, africaine, euh, pour la plupart musulmane. Si vous voulez, ça s'appelle un remplacement. Someone else was hosting it, so no one could say it was Zemmour's show. But in reality, he was the main attraction, and the show was based around the topics that he decided. With Zemmour on board, CNews's ratings took off. As of last year, the channel began challenging its commercial rival, BFM TV, for pole position among France's news networks. But as CNews created more and more controversy, the broadcast regulator, the CSA, began to take notice. In March, it issued its first ever fine to a 24-hour news channel. Zemmour had called migrant children thieves, rapists and murderers. An on-air rant that cost CNews 200,000 euros. As France's election season began, and with Zemmour sounding more and more like a candidate, the regulator decided to treat him like one under French law. In September, the CSA, headquartered here in Paris, 
forced Sea News to drop Zemmour as a paid up pundit. However, since then, the channel seems to have doubled down on its far right formula, with Zemmour or without him. Sea News recently played host to the far right author Honor Camus, inviting him to explain his influential conspiracy theory known as the Great Replacement. It claims that immigrants, who make up less than 10% of France's population, are on track to replace its white Christians. The theory is a central theme for Zemmour, despite his Jewish Algerian heritage. La trajectoire d'Éric Zemmour est unique. Hier journaliste, aujourd'hui écrivain, intellectuel, historien. The channel has also been giving Zemmour plenty of airtime as a guest. Like this exchange with a French woman of North African descent and a sea news reporter. While voyant cette scène, I have to say I was stunned when I saw the clip. I'd never seen something like that on French television. It felt like something new was happening. Allez-y, madame. Le couleur, c'est la foi, c'est ce qu'on porte en nous. Non, non. Eric Zemmour, c'est l'injonction religieuse. Qui enlève, qui enlève. Ce n'est pas la foi, madame. Est-ce que vous enlevez votre, en votre islam, foulard, madame En islam, j'attends toujours que vous enleviez mon foulard. Allez-y. Allez-y, je, je vous en prie. The scene didn't really make sense to me, and it turns out there was an element of theater to it. It seems that this woman wasn't there by chance. She lives 40 kilometers away, and the production team brought her there. La production l'a fait venir pour qu'elle se trouve là. Mais je vous en prie. We really crossed a line because this is not just about one woman removing her hijab out of her own accord. We know full well that there are lots of kind of Islamophobic attacks in France already. Uh, and, and lots of women are being, are being attacked for wearing the hijab. And now you see a potential presidential candidate who is calling very well, supported by a TV channel uh, doing this as well. C News and its parent company, Canal Plus, declined our request for an interview. However, Zemmour's appeal is not the work of one channel or even the French media alone. Far-right ideas have flourished as citizens have grown disillusioned with mainstream parties and their failure to grapple with issues ranging from unemployment to terrorism. That helped the far-right politician Marine Le Pen reach the second round of the last presidential election in 2017. But the media also played a role, hyping her rise and boosting her visibility. With Zemmour, it looks like déjà vu, only thanks to C News with an even bigger platform. On demande aux Français, est-ce que le grand remplacement est crédible et va arriver 67% des Français disent oui. C'est exactement ce que je leur ai dit. Aujourd'hui, de regarder la télévision française. Today, if you watch French TV and you are Muslim, black, you wear a hijab, you are a woman or homosexual, it is extremely violent because we are being constantly insulted by people like Eric Zemmour and others without anyone telling them that what they do is consistently hurtful. And I think these debates create a state of tension in French society, and tensions are the source of violence. La crispation, c'est vraiment la source de violence. And that's why he, he said, uh, you know, that, that journalists are his best friend because they create a buzz around him. And while we talk about Zemmour, we don't talk about unemployment. While we talk about Zemmour, we don't talk about inequalities. While we talk about Zemmour, we don't talk about climate change. And that's, I think, a big, big issue here because, of course, we should talk about Zemmour, but we can't be absorbed by his ideas either. And the problem in France at the moment, if you ask anyone about what's happening in the campaign, it's Zemmour. And finally, Facebook's been dealing with a succession of negative news reports on how the company has done so little to stop hate speech and abuse on its site. Time for a rebrand. Mark Zuckerberg's trying to reshape the narrative. So the site's parent company is now called Meta, and there are plans for a metaverse, using virtual reality to transform things like online video calls into 3D experiences. But VR cannot possibly compensate for Zuckerberg's problem with PR. His presentation style is robotic. He's a meme waiting to happen, and the parody videos now include one produced by a tourism organization in Iceland out to sell the real world. We're leaving you now with a mashup, Metaverse versus Icelandverse. Where would you rather spend your day? We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hey, and welcome to Connect. 
Today, we're gonna talk about the metaverse. Today, I want to talk about a revolutionary approach on how to connect our world without being super weird. The next platform and medium will be even more immersive, an embodied internet where you're in the experience, not just looking at it. And we call this the metaverse. It's already here. Seriously, look, it's right here. And what do we call this not so new chapter in human connectivity? The Iceland worse. Everything we do online today, connecting socially, entertainment, games, work, is gonna be more natural and vivid. In our open world experience, everything is real. And has been for millions of years. So let's start by exploring what different kinds of metaverse experiences could feel like, starting with the most important experience of all, connecting with people. You're human, right? Isn't she funny? <laughs> I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Now, please enjoy our logo.